in the course of this, in the course of my story, you actually see periodically some obscure thing happens that actually changes my life. It was the most serious battle Israel ever had. I'm going to tell you a story about Morris and myself during the 1973 war. He came to where I was in the base. Oh, Morris Khan said, OK, let's go. גם מוריס וגם אני עברנו מעבר לתעלה, היינו וממש עשינו את זה בהתגנבות יחידים. After Morris heard that his son David had been wounded at the Tala, at the Suez Canal, uh, he decided to do something for it. He wanted to help. When the Yom Kippur War broke out, there was very little communication between the Orif and the Front. There were battles going on all over. People were dying. They had no way, families had no way of knowing if their husbands or sons were still alive. A Morris Khan came down to visit David and he came by our place, which is near Ashkelon, and he was depressed. Morris uh, decided that he's also going to join. So, of course, we shot up to, to uh, Tzfat and we pulled at my next door neighbor, who is Tata Lufuri Baron, who is this gun of Chofi. Out of a yeshiva, and Uri Baron got very annoyed with us. He said, Atem Meshugayim, you're crazy. There's a war on Kunetra, we're just busy taking now. Get the hell out of here. As a matter of fact, uh, Shmuel had a valiant, which was uh, a khaki colored valiant. I said, Morris, we can get up to the Golan with your car. And we shot through Gesher Bnot Yaakov, me waving out of the car, telling the soldier, there's a beseder, and we shot into the Golan. Shugayim. And we got into Konetra. And we got into Konetra, and 12 o'clock at night, a bombardment, the Syrians bombarded the martef of the Kolnoa in Kunetra, where Morris and I were huddling with 20, 30 soldiers. And an officer came in and said, I can't communicate with my mafaked. I want you guys, some, I want volunteer to take a message down to Gesher Arik or something. So Morris Khan says, I volunteer. <laughs> I can remember going out myself and actually uh, in, in Kunetra, uh, being really on the road on the road to Damascus on having shells dropping and being with these guys in the front line and uh... the next day traveling around Kunetra all of a sudden a jeep shoots by us so Morris says who's that I said that's Hartzion he said where's he going I said he's going to kill Syrians he says we're after him <laughs> and before I know it we're going after Hartzion along the pipeline and the Syrians aren't targeting in on Hartzion, they're targeting in on us because we were in the car, they thought it was an officer. And they're targeting in on us. I said, Morris, turn around. He wouldn't turn around. I grabbed the wheel, we turned around, we came back. Uh, so he came back to Betchenai, and he came to me and another gentleman. He said, look, I want to go down south to the front, collect messages. Well, he looked really well. Can he be of help? And he found his own way. Well, look, we realized that actually there was this disconnect. We were collecting messages and seeing uh, young men who whose families thought they were killed. For example, there were two young men from Bet Chayrut and Chofit, both from the tank corps. One of them, we were told at home that he was killed, and there he was. To bring uh, soldiers in touch with their own families to encourage them, to help them. And what we did is we closed down the operation as a business. 
and we set, up, we set it up as a communications network. וזה היה הרעיון שלו, איך להביא כמה שיותר מהר את האינפורמציה על כל אחת למשפחה. So I joined Morris. Morris got a TEDx machine from uh, Shimon Peres, who was then Minister of Communications. לקח איתו עוד מישהו, ובאמת זו פעם ראשונה, בנסיעה ראשונה נדמה לי זה היה סנדלר, ובחורה שהיה לה TEDx, והם התקדמו אחרי הצבא, והיו שולחים ב-TEDx בלי הפסקה, דשים מהחיילים, וכאן במשרד בתל אביב אנחנו ארגנו כל המוחות והרבה בנות מתנדבות של 24 שעות. And each message had to be delivered that day. כי מה שהלך במלחמה הנוראה הזאת, יכלו למסור, דריש, לקבל דרישת שלום היום. אם היית מוסר מחר, יכול להיות שבלילה כבר האיש נהרג. אז זה דפק כמו מכונה משומנת. And we were off in the direction of Ismailia. I was in an ordinary Sahel uh, uniform with no insignia, nothing, and driving this big officer's car. The sound of firing and guns and thunder, etc. We were getting closer to Ismailia, but without any idea of where we were going. And I remember I said, for looking for the Chapak of Arik Shiron. Now, I didn't even know what Chapak was. But it was kind of a, a magic word, the chapak of Arik Shiron. And suddenly we found there was a car in trouble, and the driver asked us for help, and we helped him. It turned out he was the driver of Arik Shiron. And where we, was he going? He was going across the canal to his boss. And he said, follow me. When I got to the bridge that crossed over the canal, they, uh, these guys on motorbikes would move move the, the troop carriers and the tanks aside to let, to, to let us through. And uh, by nightfall, we landed up at the Chapak of Arik Sharon. And um, Arik Sharon was there writing postcards with the, uh, with the Chayalim around him. One of the Chayalim that had given me directions was actually playing a guitar. It was quite, a, quite, a, it's quite an eerie uh, situation. It actually almost didn't look real. And we were sitting around, and all of a sudden, there were two scuds coming across the air. We saw what looked like the sun, like a fireball, just arise in the desert. It was early evening and come over, and it, uh, we, nobody knew what it was. We just saw this big ball of fire coming out of the desert. And the whole place opened fire, just like in a movie. And as it came over, all hell broke, broke loose there. Uh, people started shooting at it with, uh, with rifles and with pistols, and there was, it was like a big, uh, it was like one of these Arab khaflas, you know, with, ev ev with everybody shooting, very excited. You didn't know whether it was going to fall, whether it was going to pass, and a tremendous amount of panic and excitement. And Morris and I were sitting there, and it was very exciting and very nervous. And Morris says to me, you know, Basil, this is the life. <laughs> he said, you said, boy, this is the life. <laughs> Look, Morris Kahn had a suicidal instinct. I don't think Come on. he had a suicidal instinct. In the Golan, I saw it. That actually, it was stimulating for Morris. This whole atmosphere of danger, of the thrill. That's what he enjoyed in his life, I think. He always looked for it. I'm not sure whose idea it really was. If it was mine or Shmuel's or, or who's just collectively, we actually decided that this is what we were going to do. הרגשנו חלק מהמדינה, הרגשנו שמעבר לעשייה עסקית צריך גם לתרום. And actually, after the war, when we would go to sell the Pesah Hub, these chaps would say, oh, I remember you from the war, you came to see me in Kenetra. אני הגעתי במסגרת התפקיד שלי בצבא ליום אחד לחאן ארנבה. שמשם הפציצו את דמשק, ואני פוגש אחד האנשי המכירות שהיה מפקח, אני אומר לו, אליעזר, מה אתה עושה פה? הוא אומר, הנה, אני כאן, והנה, זה הביאו לי החבר'ה מדפי זהב. אז הם עבדו מהתעלה, או אפילו מפעיד מעבר לתעלה, עד חנרנבה, 40 קילומטר מ... מדמשק, ומוריס ניהל את כל העסק הזה עם החבר'ה. זה דבר נהדר, ושדי הצניעו את זה, לא רצו עם 
עם דגלים גדולים ועם מיקרופונים על זה. ולא פורסם ואף אחד לא יודע על זה. But he wanted to do something. How could he help? This is the way he could help. And he did it like a private man, I mean. He didn't ask for any recognition. He didn't ask for any mechanism. היה מוסד בפני עצמו, עבד למען החייל של איש אחד. זה לא היה פשוט, זו הייתה פעילות ענפה, קשה, שעולה הרבה כסף גם. That's Morris. He will never let his fingers go instead of him. He will always go instead of his fingers. תן לה לזרוק ללכת במקומך, דווקא 